Uh, I noticed throughout the movie uh, themes of heavy choices, those kind of things. It got me curious in your own careers and lives. Uh, what are some of the most weighted choices uh, that you've had to make in your own life, knowing that maybe it's a turning point uh, in what you're doing in your career or other things like that, uh, and how that maybe applies into identifying with the characters in the movie and the process of making the movie, all that kind of stuff. So, uh, and by the way, Aaron Dicer, Springfield, Missouri, uh, SIFPOP.com and uh, NBCKY3. It's like a whole life, don't you think? <laughs> Like, you want to start, like, when? And then you say, oh, I should have done that, and then I shouldn't have done, you know? What do you think, Al? Well, I, I really had trouble deciding whether I should do The Godfather or not. That's a joke. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> That's, I'm wondering. Yeah. That's, That's very good. Idea. That's really good. You got was, me there. That was a tough one. I thought it was real. Okay. It was, it was a life changer. And, but at the same time, and there, it, that, that's all relevant, isn't it? It's relevant to where you are at, at that time in your life. So a decision you make uh, it, it based on, on instinct is different than this, you know? So that, that I know. But I made a couple of uh, uh, um, choices that... Uh, in terms of you know, there's life choices, of course, there's the, uh, which career is life, though. Your, your work is life, too. But I made a couple of choices that I thought were, um, I, I, I knew going in, they were, uh, and they turned out to be really very great for other people. I mean, didn't do it. But at the same time, it, you know, it's sort of, when I look back at it, I, I, that's the choice I made. It didn't bother me at all that they turned out to be well or, you know. Uh, so, uh, I, I can't remember a, a choice. There was one choice I made, but I cannot say it. <laughs> <laughs> because if I say it, it's going to be about somebody who, uh, who is still a, around and is working. And he isn't up on this stage, I'll tell you that right <laughs> But, but the, the, it, it was a choice of playing a character. And I, I was offered this tremendous opportunity. And I, I, I didn't feel right about it. And uh, uh, I then uh, went to see somebody do something that it was, a, it was connected to the role I would have played. But it was too late because some great actor had taken it, taken the part. And, and then uh, when I saw it, they were great in it, so it didn't bother me. And then I, there was another one, too, <laughs> that, it, that happened, too. But I, I felt at the time I made a choice because I, yeah, there was a period of, I'm going on talking too much. I, mean, sorry. <laughs> I have that sort of trail off thing. I go into it, and I'm gone. It's, it's, <laughs> That's... I, are you done yet? Uh, <laughs> no, I'm, waiting for, I'm waiting for Bob. Bob, you're going to do yours, right? That's great. Bunch of life choices or career choices or how do you? Um, <clears throat> well, I, I yeah, I mean, I've had a lot. It's too complicated to go into in, in this situation. But um, I guess in relation to this movie, um, I, I'm I'm very happy that we took we worked so hard to get it to where it is today, and. Um, because uh, it, it, we um, worked hard and, and are part of something very special, and then I, I'm so grateful that it seems to be getting a great reception, and that's, you know. So that's a good feeling for me and my life and my every, everybody around me. Uh, so I feel really terrific about that. I have so many other life choices that I couldn't go into, and a book you could do it, but here, mm -hmm. that, I, that I'm going, this, you know, Whatever. So, I hope that's a decent answer. Okay. Do I have to answer? <laughs> um, well, I mean, it, it's a complicated thing, of course. I mean, there. Um, I found that over the years, the choices I made in terms of making films, I, I uh, each, that it got to a point that each film was another lifetime, you know. And I went, I went ahead and made choices as to what I felt comfortable with. Um, I tried some experiments from time to time, but um, 
in so doing, I uh, uh, backed out of two or three major movies that became very popular and very famous and award-winning and that sort of thing. But I couldn't find my way in there. I didn't, not, that, uh, uh, I didn't know why until years later. And years later when I it became... So I always have this line about the, uh, the professional and uh, um, the amateur in a way. Like if I stayed an amateur, I think that was pretty good. An amateur is the word love is an amateur, you know? I'm not putting down professionals, and I, I, I always wish I could be. But um, it took me a long time to understand that, and I guess I shied away from certain projects because I just didn't know how to do them. I didn't feel I had that connection with it. And the connection has to be something personal. Um, uh, and there are other reasons too, but it's it's a more 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 layered than what I'm saying. But uh, you know, when the when the film you didn't do is a great success, and, oh maybe I, no no I couldn't, you know, I couldn't do it. Um, I, I, and if I had made it, it wouldn't have been the great success. I don't mean to put be self -depre uh, deprecation, but uh, what I mean is that it would have been a different film. You follow? And so like, you made your choice. Scott Menzel, We Live Entertainment. Um, just, just an incredible film, honestly. You just don't see movies like this anymore. Amazing. Um, you know, it, it's such an honor to talk to you. I'm sorry. Um, but uh, it's, I grew up with all of you making such incredible films. Um, talk about the challenges of reuniting and for you, Pacino, for the first time with him, but for you, De Niro, reuniting with him after all these years. Is that a challenge? <laughs> <laughs> Who goes first? Because he was asking you guys about reuniting with me. <laughs> <laughs> well, Al and I have known each other over the years. We've known each other for decades, since we were in our 20s. And um, we've worked a couple of times together, and we've had the... Uh, an unusual relationship uh, in some ways and maybe not so unusual where we always felt close uh, because of our situations and we would commiserate or confide or talk or get advice about things over the years, over the decades. And, um, and we've worked together too. Uh, and and w with this project, um, we... Um, I, Al and I were in a, at, a, at an opening in Europe. Uh, I think it might have been London. It was London, Paris, or, or, or Spain. And we, and we were so like the people were so great, and and you know the crowd. So we said, you know, why not? One day we hoped that this, we we'd be as deserving of this kind of adoration with a um, uh, with a, something that we're, we're more proud of. And and then so that this to to us is what that is. And I remember the last day of shooting of Al shooting in the in the in the Irishman. And I said, remember when we said that to each other that that time? And this you know for nothing else we 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 did it in this movie, and we should be we will be proud of it. We are proud of it. So I don't know if that's answering the question or not, but I'm just sort of you know. I'm Tom Tangney from Kyber Radio in Seattle. This, is a, this question's a little bit out of the box, so I want to warn you ahead of time. First off... Oh, no. <laughs> I, I think it's pretty clear, having seen the film now, that Mr. De Niro and Mr. Pacino, you guys were born to play the roles that you played. However, I was wondering if you would take part in a little speculation. And I, ultimately, I realize this is a question for Marty Scorsese more than the actors, but I'd like to hear from all three of you. And that is, can you imagine what the movie would be like if you two had swapped roles. If uh, Robert De Niro, you played Hoffa, <laughs> and Al, you played Frank, how different would that movie have been given uh, the same all things being equal from uh, the director's point of view? Can I answer that? Absolutely, <laughs> take it away. <laughs> Finally, a question that I got a, 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 a parable for. I'm so ready now. Sorry, guys. That's all right. Anybody got a pillow? No, no. Here it is. I was at the actor's studio, young man at the actor's studio. I was about 25 at the time. 
And I had, I was too shy to do a scene there. I've been there for about six months and I'd see people and I would be sitting and watching and then I'd go home and I didn't know anyone there. And, and, and then I finally signed up to do a scene. Because at the studio you have sessions. I'm sorry, this is gonna go on. I'm not gonna going, do it. Keep I'm going, gonna, it's I, good. I gotta slow it down. And, <laughs> So I'm there, and then, and then I had the scene, and, and I was going to do uh, Hickey from Eugene oh, O'Neill's yeah, Iceman Cometh, and Hamlet, and wrote it down. And it was my turn, finally, to go up in front of the great Lee Strasberg at the actor's studio, the, you know, the hallowed actor's studio, with all these people who sit out there. And what they do is you do a scene, and afterward, they sort of, they don't, I criticize it, they discuss it with Lee as the moderator, because it is for professionals. It's not an acting school, the actor's studio. So anyway, I, I went up there, and Lee Strasberg was sitting where he sat in the front, and you'd go up on this stage there at the studio, and he said, wow, this is, first of all, he said, Al Pacino. He pronounced my name right. That, I, that never happened. <laughs> I went to a whole school, a public school, and they never, Pekini, Pekuno, Pekani, that kind of thing. But I said, he's pronounced my name right. I, he, you know, he's a great man. So I went up there and I did a monologue from The Iceman Cometh, which I had done all my life. And I did it, and it was over. And then I turned around and I started Hamlet. <laughs> oh, what a rogue. Because he said, he looked at the card, he's Al Pacino, Hamlet <laughs> and Hickey from the Iceman oh coming. God, he said, terrible. all right, let's, let's, okay, let's go do it. And I got up there and I did Hickey. I did it all. And then I turned around and I did Hamlet. <laughs> and he said to me, Stopped the class, he th I mean, it was quiet, and he said, all right, I want you to do Hickey as Hamlet, and Hamlet as Hickey. Wow, there you go. That's great. Right? That is great. What did I do? Immediately, I went into Hickey as Hamlet, and Hamlet as Hickey. Oh, I did them both, <laughs> and you know what he said? We take in all kinds here, and the audience was standing up. <laughs> so what happened is, I did both parts, Relatively well, I guess. <laughs> but the point is, that, that, that's the point. That you, you inspired that yeah. story. I'm sorry, but it's good. It's, it's, is it, does it answer it? Does it answer it? I've been wanting to tell that story for years. Finally, I've been. Um, I wanted to talk to you specifically about the de-aging, not the CGI aspect of it, but the way you shot it on set, how you lit those scenes, how you were able to get those scenes shot so that your visual effects artist could, could de-age them. And for Mr. Pacino and Mr. De Niro, when you saw the younger version of yourself on screen for the first time, what is the one role of yours that came to mind when you saw that younger version of yourself? And, and Kevin McCarthy, uh, uh, WTTG, Washington, D.C. Thank you very much. Uh, technical issue. Uh, uh, th th this um, computer-generated imagery uh, was really designed by ILM, Pablo Hellman, and everybody there. And so, um, in conjunction with Rodrigo Prieto, they worked this out uh, in terms of lighting. Uh, you know, is stuff that I didn't um, necessarily participate in terms of. Uh, uh, there were some technical things. And why is that there? And that explained well because the marker on the face has to hit a certain place, et cetera. Um, but I, I didn't find that their work with the technical aspects of the lighting that was necessary interfered in any way with what, what I was doing and what the actors were doing. And I, I think um, the, 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 one of the key uh, uh, changes that we noticed on set really was the, the, the cameras themselves. The cameras had uh, three lenses and I was shooting uh, two cameras a lot of the time, so we had six lenses. And we had extra crew. But, and we were carrying nine cameras all together because of other issues. And so it became uh, uh, a pretty big operation in a way. Um, and there was a little ritual. Oh yeah, but the, the center lens was capturing the image. Then there were lenses on either side that were dealing with the uh, information coming from the, the, 
computer onto the, from the markers on their faces, and which were uh, developed in such a way as they were almost invisible, which was great. And the thing about it, then there was this sort of ritual after each time we did a take, everything would stop, and a young man would come out, and he'd have a board with something, some kind of design on it, and he'd move it a certain way. And I'd be looking at, what the hell is this? And, and then it was dead quiet, and then he goes back, and then he comes out with a silver ball, and the ball moved. And I would call it the adoration of the ball <laughs> at this point. And I realized it was like a benediction of some kind. And he turned it, and then the ball was opaque. It wasn't silver. And he moved it a certain way. I still don't know exactly what that is. <laughs> but at that point, at first I was saying, what the hell am I waiting for? And then I realized, this is what's going to be. This is how, now we do the, 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 the slate, now we do the ball, now we wait. Okay, now everybody can move on. And every time we were using that stuff, that's what we do. Remember, it sort of became like a, 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 a welcome ritual. Um, and that was the only, um, the only thing that I felt was, um, uh, that I was cognizant of, really, uh, on the set. And I think, basically, one of the, the things that was interesting was the nature of movement that you guys had to work with. Maybe you could talk about that, you know? And the role you saw when you first saw yourself together. Well, uh, for me, um, the, the, the challenge would come pretty much every time I really moved in the thing. So um, they'd say, Al, you're 39. <laughs> and I'd say, I know that. <laughs> and, and it would say, all right. And then they'd say, 39, and I'd have to be in the scene, and I'd have to get up. Yeah. And this, this, with start. <laughs> and we had a thing. guy, we had a guy yeah. there just come up to you and say, you're 39, you get up at a, like a 39-year-old. And I say, oh, yeah, I never do this scene. And I, uh, get up like that. <laughs> so I was, I wondered how you guys. Did. Well, the thing was that he came up to me and he said, it was the first day of shooting. And he said, uh, you, you were yelling at the TV about the Kennedys and stuff. And you yeah. got up. And I said, great. And then we did another take. I said, terrific. Okay, we're going to do one more. And then we're going to, and they came up to me and they said, he's supposed to be 49 in this. And I said, wow. oh, what does that mean? I said, he, does, he doesn't look like he's getting up at 49. So I told the guys, I said, you tell him. <laughs> It's the first day I'm working with the man. I don't want to go over. Hey, what are you doing? 40 years we haven't worked. I got to get the first thing I'm going to tell him. So, <laughs> hey, so they, I said, okay, okay, I'll go tell him. So I said, Al, everything's fine. Said, yeah, yeah. I said, the only thing is you're 49. He went, oh. And I said, okay, I'll, I get it. I get it. So we did another take, and you got up. And we cut, and he said, what do you think? And he said, 62. <laughs> it became a number game. <laughs> Until you finally got it. <laughs> I'm Jennifer Marin. I'm from New York. Um, I'm president of the Alliance of Women Film Journalists and the film critic for the Rio Times. And thank you very much for a brilliant film and for all of your work that you've done throughout your careers. This film, in watching this film, I think I felt a sort of a seismic shift in your movie making. There is a real connection here to uh, concern about social impact and um, the effect that uh, film can have uh, in the world. And you've been obsessed and working on the issue of corruption and crime for many, many years. I'm just wondering whether you came into this with a notion of, or, or you feel that there has been a change in your, um, the overall working, uh, the overall structure of the film and the overall intent of the film with regard to social uh, and, and political issues of the day. That's for me? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, yes, there was a, uh, there was a change. Um, and uh, having gone through Mean Streets and Goodfellas and Casino, uh, uh, you know, I had covered the territory in uh, specific ways at those times. You know, uh, the overall issue of corruption is, is something that, I'm, that I tend, tend to be uh, uh, attracted to as material. Um, and um, what, what happened with this, with Frank, when you described the character to me, and I read the book, the book had this whole backdrop of this history. They say, uh, their history, the history of the United States, the world, all this going on. And I said, I think I know what to do. I think it's a matter of just like having a cut the whole thing down to uh, its essentials, and deal with the emotional impact. 
ultimately of the life you lead, you know? And everything else, whether it's the Cuban Missile Crisis or, you know, Joey Gallo being shot, it's all peripheral, all forgotten about ultimately. Um, and so, in a way, it freed me. Um, and in terms of corruption, it's, it's that part of the human being. It's a, in, in the, the asphalt jungle, uh, Louis Calhern has a line, it's great, where he goes, uh, his wife says, why do you always, he's a lawyer, why do you always uh, uh, defend uh, the uh, bad guys and gangsters and that sort of thing? He goes, well, I, I look at um, crime as sort of a left-handed a left-handed um, endeavor of human, of human, of the human condition. And yeah, it's the left and the right in the sense of the right hand of the father, the left hand of the, you know, the whole sense of that's part of who we are. And how, it's always there, the dark forces are always there. Do we succumb to them um, all the time? Do we get sucked in and pulled back out? I mean, this is, this is the whole thing. It has to do with our own, you know, our pride too. Uh, in the case of Jimmy, when he keeps saying it's my union, it damn well is his union. But he lost it. He lost it. Um, in any event, um, it, 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 it's more than corruption. It's about what's in ourselves as uh, human beings. I'm Kathy Woods, Cup of Soul Show. My question is, um, how do you, like in, in this climate where we're questioning, we're a little bit more aware of how a person comes to crime, and what are some of the things that makes a person go from good to bad? How, do you feel like you have a responsibility to show the effects and also some of the causes? Or do you just feel like, you know, creatively, I'm just going to make the movie and it lands. It takes me wherever, you know, your instincts take you, any of you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, sorry, guys. I got it. Uh, for me, it's always, uh, it's always been for different reasons, personal reasons or whatever. I'm aware of people that I knew around me sometimes who I knew were genuinely good people but wound up doing bad things. And then, ultimately, are they cast out? You know, are they cast out of uh, a religious institution or are they cast out of the society around them? In some cases, they are. But in terms of uh, certain religious aspects, as I have, I mean, silence and movies like that, you know, the bottom line is the wretched the ones who couldn't help it, the ones who, who, who can't do any, any, anything else. They're the ones that demand the compassion. And it's very hard, you know, and there's a compassion and understanding. You may hate it, you may get, you know, I don't know, but that's a very important thing to, to um, nurture in, hum, in human being and not cut people off dead. I remember back in, uh, when Mean Streets were shown at the, um, uh, New York Film Festival, one critic who actually was very nice with me at certain times, but this, this, this time he hated the film. And, um, uh, well, Mean Streets was the first, and afterwards he was very nice about certain films. Anyway, I don't want to mention his name. Good guy, let him be. Uh, a long time ago. Anyway, uh, there was another film that ended the festival. It was a terrific film, and I want to mention the name because it is a beautiful film, and the filmmaker's a good friend. But uh, when the festival was over, he, he wrote um, uh, that... The last film, the, the film I just mentioned, is the front page. That's the front pages. Mean Streets is the back page. And I said, well, you didn't like the movie. But then, I, then over the years I realized, that's right, it is the back page. The back page what? You know, what is that? Human beings, uh, it's still about, it's the back page, a guy shot in an alley, uh, somebody caught and rested and uh, spends 20 years in life for, uh, for something, in, in jail for something that, uh, you know, five years later the law changes. Um, yeah, what about them? We're the back pages, you know? So that's what we've been doing. Mosey Persico, CTV, Montreal. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for being here. And as a proud Italian born in Italy, it's an honor to, to share the same space with you. I mean, our family dogs are called Pacino and De Niro. <laughs> True story. Mr. De Niro knows that. And that that's a fact. Mr. That's Pacino fact. will show you a picture. And our next one will be called Marty. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, that's it. I promise. Uh, first of all, uh, Mr. Scorsese, congratulations on creating another filmmaking masterpiece. Mr. De Niro and Mr. Pacino, in addition to all of you being Academy Award winning actors, you're also directors, Mr. De Niro and Mr. Pacino. I know that Mr. De Niro has continuously worked with Mr. Scorsese, it's his ninth collaboration. Mr. Pacino, it's your first collaboration. From a filmmaking point of view, did you 
acquire any directing techniques after working with this genius? Do you hear that? <laughs> I, I did. Uh, well, that's a really interesting question. I, I, I have, this is the second one today. I, I'm really, uh, I really, I'm glad to say this. I directed films in the sense that I was the director, the filmmaker of it, but I'm not a director and I'm not a filmmaker. They are. And I say that with all, I'm not I'm being, uh, uh, you know, it's just, I make films, like when I do it, it's, I, it's a learning experience for me, and it's a sense of doing a home movie I have, uh, you know, and it's, and, and, and this is where I learn about, I learned about film by directing a film. I learned about editing and what it was by doing my own, the own, like, how does someone, I have to say, I was fortunate to have done Looking for Richard. Yeah. I did that because I had some idea, but really why I did it, what was motivated me, was that I did Richard III several times, and when I did it in New York on Broadway, the reviewer said, Pacino has set back Shakespeare 50 years in America. <laughs> and I said, oh. That can't be. <laughs> I love Shakespeare. Oh, yeah, I love it. And I had done it. I had done it in, you know, in Boston. To, and there's a whole reason why that thing didn't happen. And one of the reasons was it, 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 it didn't have a concept in terms of, it's so interesting. You know, I, I, I could go on forever, and I'm going to do that. I'm going to go on forever. <laughs> but when we did it in the, at the Loeb Theater, it didn't work at all. This, I was a young guy, just, but I became, I was famous already. But I had done Richard III, because I knew I had done it at the Actors Studio and had a feeling for it. I just wanted to do it, and I wanted to learn. I always pretty much want to learn. And, and working with these guys, I learned a lot. I always, that's sort of what I leave my, that's probably why I continue to do it. But I, I did it, and I did it at the Loeb. This is interesting. And, and the set was, yeah, yeah, because I'll, Tell you something about Irishmen and what they did in Irishmen uh, uh, about a, a set. I'm, you've seen it, so I can talk to you about it. But, <laughs> but I, I did it at the, at the Loeb in, in, in Cambridge. And I mean, I was going on with a fever. I was all, you know, no, I had my friend was all giving me the words, and I had two weeks, but it wasn't there. And I, and I go out, and you, you haven't lived until you go out in the second act. And, uh, there's, there's a lot of red seats in front of you. <laughs> the half the audience left, maybe two thirds. And I thought, what do I do? What, what's wrong with me? And so, uh, but then I turned around and look at the set and the set was a bunch of bars. I don't know what the hell, it, who did that and what it came from. I had no idea what I was doing, you know, uh, now is the winter of our discontent, but, and, but in front of a bars. And I don't know where the hell I was. So they, threw me out of Boston, they threw me out of, out, of, out, of, out of Cambridge. But as I was leaving, my great friend and mentor, Charlie Lawton, said to me, Al, I don't know, I think I see something there. I see something there in what you're doing. David Wheeler, the great theater company of Boston, director, he came and said, Al, let's not just give this up, please. I said, oh, well, I know, but I feel, you know, I want to get out of town or something. And they said, no, 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 we got this Church of the Covenant. It was right on Marlborough Street, beautiful. This church. And we all went in there, this medieval sort of thing. And I came up, there was a pulpit, and I came up from the pulpit like this with a stocking hat on. And I said, now is the winter of our discount. And the thing just started to go. We had a set. That's, no. We had a concept, a context. You understand? And when we went to Broadway, we didn't bring the church. <laughs> and these are important things. Now, there's a scene, if you saw it, in, uh, um, in The Irishman, where uh, 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 Jimmy Hoffa is going to his end. He doesn't know it. He goes into this place, this, this uh, house. house yeah. And I walked in on the first day on the set of this particular scene. I walked into the house 
and I see this house, nothing you could really overtly recognize, but I knew that this house was deadly, just the way they had put it together. But you couldn't find it. They, they didn't have things all over it. It was just simple furniture, but in such a way, I thought, this is so, I mean, you talk about artful, and, and, and that's what I saw. This is what is done as directors. And, 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 you, and you saw, it didn't do anything, but it, this is a place where someone was going to die. Yeah. And and it looked like a normal little no, but, house, but it wasn't because they did certain things. And if he ever would go into the details of what they did, yeah, you'd know what yeah. they did. It was a lot, <laughs> but it looked like nothing. So I, I don't see the world that way. I don't see the world as uh, of my 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 creative uh, feelings don't come from getting concepts like that. It, it, this isn't me. So I'm not a director, because I, I don't want to. First thing I do when I finish the film is I go read a play. What play am I going to do? You know, I'll do Richard again, um, in a church, of course. You know, but, but that's my thing. So the other directing things I did is because I liked particular plays. If I did Chinese coffee, I'm sure none of you saw it. it didn't. Uh, uh, well, that's good to hear. <laughs> I did it because I very much wanted to, I, enjoy, I wanted to preserve that, uh, piece of material that I really liked it. I liked what it was. I liked the writer, uh, Ira Lewis, who's gone now. And I, I liked that atmosphere of what those guys were going through in the village and the, the, the artists in the, in the, in the, from the 60s, now in the 80s. And the whole concept made me feel like I wanted, to, I wanted to be in it. And I didn't have anyone I could pay to direct it, so I did it myself. That's why I directed. And then I directed another thing called The Local Stigmatic, again, which was very interesting. And, you know, and I did that, knowing that this is not gonna go anywhere. But it was a way of me preserving some of the stuff. I had the, I had the money at the time, so I was able to help with the financing of it. And that was my reasoning. So even though I directed film and whatever, I, I don't look at it, I don't look at myself that way. I have no desire to do it. And I have great, respect and admiration for people who just do that. And it's not me, it's like, you know, you're, 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 you, 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 I, I like football, but I won't play it. 